Welcome this morning to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Marie Lewis with NASA Public Affairs. And I'm Josh Barrett with Boeing Communications. Starliner is nearly ready for our uncrewed orbital flight test. You can see it over our shoulders, lit up on the launch pad. It's a little windy out, but right now that won't stop liftoff scheduled for 6.36 a.m. Eastern Time. Let's take a look again at the pad. Ground crews are currently wrapping up operations in the White Room. I want to take you back to about 4.34 a.m. this morning. That's when they actually closed the hatch inside the White Room. We should have some video of them wrapping up that operation. Yeah, and uh, there, uh, there you go. There you see it. Now, the, the pad team is actually running about 45 minutes ahead of schedule which is really awesome news on their first time doing this. Yeah, remarkable because this is the first time um, they're doing it for real. Um, it's so It was so cool. I mean, this this video you're seeing was a little bit earlier this morning. Like you said, they're ahead of schedule, so they're, they've already left the white room, but um, everything is looking good, and there's no crew flying today, uh, but teams are operating just as if astronauts are on board. Now this is a live view. Um, you see the crew still up there on the tower, um, and we are... As we get closer to launch, we're going to see the white room and the crew access arm start to swing away from Starliner on, uh, in preparation for liftoff. But there they are uh, making those final preparations to leave the pad. Now, this uncrewed test flight is incredibly important for us to prove that we can safely fly astronauts to the International Space Station. This is a huge day for the entire NASA, Boeing, and United Launch Alliance teams. Since the space shuttle program ended, we've all been working hard to return human spaceflight capability to the United States. We call this effort NASA's Commercial Crew Program. It's a partnership we have with Boeing and SpaceX, and today is Starliner's big debut. And our goal is for everyone watching today to see a mission as close as possible to a crewed flight and to collect the mountains of data that we can only learn from flying. It's also the first time our mission teams have a chance to put Starliner through its paces. We've all been practicing, but now, as you can see in the control room, it's game day. We're really excited to show you how this all comes together. Teams from NASA, Boeing, and ULA all have to be in lockstep to be successful today. We all have people spread across the country sitting on console. We have three control rooms here in Florida. United Launch Alliance's Atlas Space, Space Flight Operations Center is on the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Starliner's Launch Control, the Boeing Mission Control Center, is just across the street from us here at Kennedy. And NASA's Emergency Operations Center is activated, ready to respond at a moment's notice. Then in Houston at Johnson Space Center, the Space Station Control Room is following the mission closely as well. And Starliner's Mission Control is just down the hall from that Space Station Control Room. That's where flight controllers are actually commanding the vehicle right now. And finally, ULA also has teams in Denver monitoring ascent. So we want to check in first with the Atlas Launch Control Team. They're just a few miles away from where we're sitting here in Florida, and their job is to make sure the rocket stays healthy right now, leading up to and during launch. We have United Launch Alliance's Dylan Rice monitoring this morning's activ activities over in the ASOC. Dylan, how is the rocket doing? Hey, good morning, Josh and Marie. Uh, things are great here this morning. It's been a, a really good morning. As you can see, the, uh, the team rolled Atlas, Centaur, and Starliner out to the pad uh, a day ago. Teams have been working overnight to prepare the vehicle for launch. Um, all of our propellant tanks are loaded. The vehicle is in stable topping while the uh, the ground crews finish up their final loading of the cargo on the Starliner. And uh, I understand all that's been completed now, and the team is starting to close out the um, the white room for uh, for operations today. This is a big day for us. This is a return of Atlas to its uh, human spaceflight heritage. 
the uh, first U.S. astronaut to orbit the Earth was uh, John Glenn, and he launched on an Atlas LV-3B rocket just up the road at Complex 14 back in February 1962. So we're really excited about getting Atlas back to the human spaceflight business. Um, it's also a return to service of our dual-engine configuration of Centaur. Uh, the the dual-engine Centaur is very uniquely qualified to uh, provide the amount of thrust and the type of uh, flight profile necessary in order to give uh, Starliner a safe and smooth ride to the International Space Station. Uh, also on Centaur, we've added an emergency detection system, which is kind of a supplemental telemetry system that it independently evaluates all of the data on board the vehicle to ensure that the uh, ride is as safe as possible for astronauts when uh, when the time comes for that. We take safety very seriously. Uh, it's at the forefront of everything we do, and adding that uh, emergency detection system to Centaur is just one more way we can assure that the astronauts get the safest ride possible when it comes time to launch those on the next mission. Uh, atop Centaur is a CST-specific vehicle adapter. It's a truss and ring structure that uh, basically holds the Starliner to Centaur. Uh, and on, along with that is an aero skirt, which helps enhance their aerodynamics and stability of the vehicle during flight. Uh, but today's not just about testing the rocket. Uh, it's also an opportunity to demonstrate the processes and procedures that we're going to use when it comes time to actually load crew on board that spacecraft, and we've been working on that this morning. Um, so for now, the ground crew is still up on the crew access tower. Uh, they are closing out the white room. As I understand, the uh, the team is wrapped up in the capsule. You guys showed that video just a few minutes ago of the uh, hatch closure. So uh, our team has taken over and uh, preparing the crew access tower and the white room for launch. Uh, that's that's it for the update here at the ASOC. Back to you guys over at Kennedy Space Center. All right. Thanks a lot, Dylan. Now, if you remember space shuttle launches, you might recall there were fewer control rooms. Um, but this is a whole new way of doing things, and that's really the whole point of the commercial crew program. Exactly. Today, you have a commercial spacecraft launching on a commercial rocket, and both of those have their own control rooms. And NASA is watching it all, making sure everyone's making the right calls, and that's going to be especially important when crews on board. So let's learn a little bit more about those commercial vehicles on the pad behind us today. First is the Atlas V rocket that's made and operated by United Launch Alliance. It's a workhorse rocket with 80 successful missions to date. This is a special version of Atlas made just for Starliner. ULA calls it an N22. That stands for no payload fairing, two solid rocket motors, and a dual engine Centaur upper stage, a first for the Atlas V. And on top of Atlas is Boeing CST-100 Starliner. It comes in two main sections, a crew module and a service module. The crew module is where the astronauts would be. It's reusable up to 10 times and it features lightweight thermal protection as well as an innovative landing system using parachutes and airbags. Those make Starliner the first American orbital capsule able to land on land. The service module houses most of our propulsion systems, including the on-orbit maneuvering thrusters and our low-altitude abort motors. We also have a high-efficiency solar array on the bottom, which covers a micrometeorite and orbital debris shield. Now we want to check in on how that spacecraft is doing, and we happen to have one of Starliner's engineers, Tori Pedrotti. She's in Boeing's Launch Control Center monitoring the launch team there for us. Tori, how are things going for the BMCC's very first mission? Good morning, Josh and Marie. Everything is going great here in the BMCC. As you said, this is the Boeing Mission Control Center. This is the heart of Starliner while we're on the ground, while we're doing launch operations, and then transition, we will transition control over to Houston. Uh, here, here in uh, Florida, we are just super excited and as you can see we have a lot of people tied in to their consoles here. Now we have a bunch of different teams in this control room. Not only NASA teams and Boeing teams working together, but analysts also looking at all of the different subsystems, including thermal, propulsion, ECLIS, anything that the spacecraft needs to continue on its mission to the International Space Station. So uh, looking back at the rocket now, you can see that um, we were just talking a little bit about the pad team. Now this pad team was a joint ULA and Boeing team. And this is only the second time that we've had people near a fueled Atlas V. So when you saw that hatch closure and that white room clear out just a few minutes ago, that was only the second time in history that we've had people this close um, to a fueled Atlas V. The first time was during our wet dress rehearsal a few weeks ago. Now the wet dress rehearsal is where we fuel the vehicle and we do everything, follow all of our procedures except for la except launch. Now today we're really excited to follow all of our procedures and launch. So it's, it's a really exciting day. Um, and this pad team and the views that we're seeing here in the white room are really just a hallmark of human spaceflight. 
having people and being able to load people and cargo at the last minute is going to be really essential for our crewed flights later on. And OFT, this orbital flight test that we do, does not have crew on it, but we're really practicing like we would to make sure that we do that we are safe and we're ready when we do have crew on board next time. So let's take a little bit closer look at that pad team. Melanie Weber is the pad team lead. She is the first female pad team lead. Melanie has uh, worked for multiple years on the commercial crew program, but before that she worked on ISS. So she knows not only about our vehicle, but about where we're going uh, and a lot about the International Space Station as well. Melanie is the crew and cargo lead, and she has been in charge of the interior of the capsule from the very beginning. So she was involved when there was nothing in there, and now it's, and now she has designed the entirety of the inside of the vehicle and has led the team to close it out. So that's really exciting, and it's a good day for her, and it's a great day for the team as they clear out of the tower. So back to you, Josh and Marie. All right, thanks a lot, Tori. It's, it's good news that Starliner's looking great for launch. Really great news. You know, the first time you're doing anything, there's always elements of unknown, but great news from the control rooms. So let's learn a little bit more about those control rooms and who's leading those teams in those Starliner control rooms today. In the BMCC, Starliner's first launch conductor is Lewis Atchison, a native Floridian. Lewis has dreamed of working in spaceflight his whole life, and he's actually made a few cuts in the astronaut selection process himself. As launch conductor, he leads the pre-launch and ground operations campaign and helps the team work through any issues that come up in the countdown. And Lewis's counterpart in Mission Control Houston is Richard Jones. Richard is a veteran NASA flight director assigned to Starliner. On this uncrewed flight, his team is completely responsible for commanding and controlling Starliner. Known as flight in the control room, he makes every critical decision during launch and ascent. He will hand off to another flight control team for orbital operations, but he'll be back for landing. Now these two teams have to be perfectly in sync before launch and then during flight the BMC will transition to kind of a backroom mission support room and they will stay on console 24-7 through flight and help the flight controllers in Houston work through any issues if they do come up. That's right. We want to check in with uh, Richard Jones and his team in Starliner Mission Control over in Houston. There we have NASA's Brandy Dean and Boeing's Steve Seisloff keeping tabs on the progress. Hi Steve and Brandy. Good morning, welcome to Starliner Mission Control in Houston. I am Steve Seisloff from Boeing Communications. And I'm Brandy Dean from NASA Public Affairs. And right here is where Richard Jones is uh, and his team are watching closely over all the systems and subsystems of Starliner this morning. Launch is time to put the uh, Starliner on a precise path. It's gonna be time to, uh, when the launch site there at Cape Canaveral lines up, with the 51.6-degree uh, orbital plane of the International Space Station. That's when Atlas V will lift off and put Starliner right on the course it needs to chase the International Space Station. And speaking of the International Space Station, just down the hall here in Mission Control Houston, there's a whole other flight control team watching um, the space station systems, making sure that it is ready for the Starliner to arrive tomorrow. That team is led by Flight Director Chris Edelin. He is um, getting ready to poll his own team to make sure that they're ready for today's launch, and he will be on uh, console again tomorrow for that rendezvous. All of that uh, is a culmination of years of preparation for the International Space Station, and it's going to be poised and ready to see Starliner in space tomorrow. We'll keep an eye on things here in Houston, but for now we'll go back to Florida. All right, thanks Brandy and Steve. Good news from all the control rooms, so things are looking good for launch. You know, just really great news for an important first step in this NASA Boeing partnership that will help commercialize low Earth orbit. But NASA is also working a, on a lot of other exciting things like their next giant leap with the Artemis program. And NASA's Daryl Nail is joined by NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine nearby to talk about all the exciting things we're working on right now. Hi, Daryl. Hi, Marie and Joshua. That's right. We're here at the top of the OSB building, just a few feet away from where you guys are with a beautiful view of the rocket. Mr. Bridenstine is here. Of course, simply put, the big boss over all of NASA. Or just Jim. Or just Jim, in this case. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, just tell me, you've been here for the week. Yeah. Um, what are you feeling right now and the excitement as it builds up to this launch? So I will tell you, the, uh, the level of energy here is really amazing. Um, and, and this is not new to the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, but certainly it's been a long time since we've flown humans, in, humans into space. And this is one of those opportunities where we're meeting a, a critical milestone, an end-to-end -end test of one of our commercial crew vehicles. 
Uh, I, I will tell you, you know, I, I, I was in the Orlando area years ago when the shuttles were, were getting ready to retire and the Constellation program was, was standing up and then, and then it got canceled. Uh, this, th the Kennedy Space Center is back. Um, the commercial partners are doing amazing things. There's, there's an energy here that is just, it's palpable. So it feels really good to be here right now. Very good. It was a tough time at yeah. the retirement of the shuttle indeed. And, and now it looks like we're just getting ready to turn the corner. The big question everybody wants to know is, when will astronauts be riding on one of these spacecraft? So we have two different uh, commercial crew providers, SpaceX and Boeing. And I I'm confident that, uh, that we will have in the first part of 2020, at least one successful launch with, with astronauts. Um, I would say that um, I I'm actually confident we'll have two uh, partners in the first part of 2020. Uh, but, but, you know, remember what the goal is. The goal is to have two independent solutions uh, so that if, if one has a setback, the other can move forward. Um, and so that's why we have dissimilar redundancy. And so this, this increases the probability of success. So I would say first part of 2020 is what we can look forward to. And you were telling me as a backup, you've sought to purchase seats on Soyuz. Absolutely. Yeah. And why is that? We need to make sure that we, we don't have a gap in Americans on the International Space Station. Uh, the partnership between the United States and Russia has been strong since 1975. Uh, we want to keep it moving forward. Um, and, and we want to make sure that it, you know, even when commercial crew is successful, we want Americans launching on Soyuz rockets and we want Russians launching on commercial crew rockets. The partnership needs to be strong. Half of the International Space Station is Russian. So it's important for us as we maintain this partnership uh, that we move forward in a meaningful way. All right, Jim, thanks for joining us. Enjoy the launch today. Thank you. Joshua and Marie, we'll send it back to you guys. All right, thank you so much, Daryl and Jim. Well, the last time we launched astronauts, if you remember, from the United States was in 2011. And to restore that capability, as you heard them just talking about, NASA turned to private companies like Boeing to provide the ride, and then NASA buys the ticket, if you will, for our astronauts. That's right. This partnership is all about opening up orbit and fostering new capabilities in commercial human spaceflight. Stand by for terminal count. Stage two, pressing for flight. Five, four, the purpose of the commercial crew program is to return to our nation the capability to fly our astronauts to the International Space Station. Three, two, one. There's just something about going to space that has always been special. So here's an opportunity to go back again in, in a different kind of craft. Lift off. The Commercial Crew Program is revolutionary in a sense where it's going to provide us the opportunity to have more astronauts in space. It's going to further our ability for knowledge in a microgravity environment. The fact that we're able to partner with commercial industries allows us to fulfill that mission to be explorers because we can work together. There's a larger group of us that are dreaming that potentially could have a ride someday and be working in space. Folks all over the world are going to be watching this because we're integrating new technology that can make these spacecraft better and smarter and paving the way for the future. It's truly an exciting time in spaceflight, and we want you to get involved online and on social media. If you want to learn more about Starliner, head to boeing.com slash Starliner. We have more details about the vehicle and the teams, as well as some educational activities. And we have something called a Next Gen STEM website. It has learning activities for students of all grade levels. Of course, you can learn about all things commercial crew on the program's main page. You see all three of those there on your screen. And if you have a question you want answered, just hop on Twitter and make sure you use the hashtag AskNASA. In fact, we've already been getting some great questions. Um, we want to take one. I want to show you. We had one from uh, Mark on Twitter. He was asking where Starliner is going to land after all this. So that's a great question. As we said earlier, Starliner is going to be the first American orbital crew capsule that can land on land. So we have five landing sites out in the western United States. Wherever we land depends heavily on where we are when we undock. So right now, if we stay on schedule for landing on the 28th, we'll land on the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. You can also follow us on Twitter at Boeing Space and at Commercial underscore Crew. Use the hashtag Starliner. Show us how you're watching today's launch. And as we mentioned before, we are launching from Cape Canaveral, located on the eastern coast of Florida. And joining us now is a special guest who has a vested interest in what happens here in the Sunshine State. Daryl Nail is with us again with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. That's right, Joshua. We are here with uh, Governor DeSantis. Thanks for joining us and taking the time. You're here for the launch. You've been here for a few days. Did you get a tour? 
Uh, well, we just came from the briefing, which was very interesting, and um, you know, this is an exciting day. Uh, I would say wake up bright and early, but it's not even bright yet. It's so <laughs> early, but it, but this is really great. I mean, this we really in Florida are proud of what's going on here at Kennedy Space Center. We think this is the epicenter of all the the new innovations with space, particularly the commercial uh, government partnerships. And so we think this is going to be great. And then we look to continue to do this and and get American astronauts uh, back up into space and eventually on the moon. You recall here in Florida the retirement of the space shuttle program in 2011. Um, that kind of shook the state for a while, especially here at the Space Coast. Oh, big time. Uh, Jim Bridenstine, the NASA Administrator, and I both got elected to Congress in 2012. My district was just north of here, starting in Volusia County. So we had a lot of people who would work here who lived in that district, uh, in the southern part of that district. And uh, you could tell, I mean, it was a um, you know, really bad time uh, for, for here. And it was almost like, you know, we were so proud of everything's going on here. It's like, what's happening? Well, I think, you know, we're back with a vengeance now. So it's really exciting to see uh, the direction this is going. You see it turning the corner and getting commercial. Would you ride on one of these spacecraft? I think it would depend on the circumstances and everything, but um, I think I think I'd be more of a liability than anything for them. So I don't know if they'd what want me on there. Well, I mean, you know, these these people really know what they're doing. Yeah. So you know, they're autopiloted now. But, so but, right. So if you if you decide you want to change okay. your mind, you'll let us know. Governor, thank you so much. Yeah, thank and you. Enjoy the launch. Appreciate it. All right, we'll send it back to you guys. Thanks to both of you. We are definitely back in a big way. And now about 44 minutes from launch, um, we want to take a look again at Launch Complex 41. Starliner sitting atop Atlas V, getting closer and closer to liftoff. And today's orbital flight test is our dress rehearsal for launching astronauts. Boeing is proud to be sending veteran space shuttle astronaut Chris Ferguson on our next launch, the crew flight test, to the International Space Station. Ferguson will join NASA astronaut Mike Fink, who is no stranger to the space station. Fink served on two long-duration flights as its science officer and commander, and he flew on Space Shuttle Endeavour's final mission. Now, the third crew member is NASA astronaut Nicole Mann, and Boeing's crew flight test will be her first trip to space. The trio have been training for every aspect of the mission together, learning the Starliner systems, and preparing for life and work aboard the International Space Station, where they could be staying for up to six months. The crew has been training for both routine and emergency operations on the ground and in flight. But keep in mind, Starliner is not going to be empty for this flight. It is packed with almost 600 pounds of NASA cargo. And we also have an anthropometric test device who will teach us a lot about what this ride will be like for the astronauts. Meet Rosie. She's the Starliner's commander for this very first mission. We named her after Rosie the Riveter, an icon who inspired generations of women to join aerospace. Today, Rosie the Rocketeer is flying for everyone on our team who took on the challenge of human spaceflight and said, we can do it. Her flight isn't just symbolic. She has 15 sensors that will collect valuable data we'll use to make sure the future astronauts stay safe and healthy on Starliner. And she has a companion with her. There you see Snoopy. He's getting another chance to go to space. Snoopy has a long history with NASA going all the way back to the Apollo program when we sent astronauts to the moon. And now Snoopy's a part of the next era of human spaceflight with commercial crew and NASA's Artemis program. He's got an important job too as our gravity indicator. So when Starliner reaches microgravity, he will start floating out of that pilot's seat. Now, Rosie and Snoopy are definitely going to need some help flying Starliner. Mostly that help's going to come from Starliner's autonomous flight systems, and they'll be relying on that to get the station and back. But the ground teams will also be monitoring and intervening if needed. So we want to check on those people who will be commanding Starliner from here on Earth. Steve and Brandy, how are things over in Houston? Thanks, Marie. Things are moving along into the pre in the pre-launch checklist today. The team here in Mission Control uh, now tracking 41 minutes away from launch, and they're working through that checklist, making sure that they are ready to take control of Starliner once it does lift off the launch pad today. And when it does, um, Flight Director Richard Jones and the Starliner Mission Control team will finally get to put to work all the skills they've honed in exhaustive flight simulations over the past months. They've already been sending some commands to Starliner for things like cabin pressurization and communications checks. And as soon as the Starliner spacecraft lifts off the launch pad, this group of space flight specialists will be watching carefully and making commands where needed to keep the uh, vehicle on its precise path to the International Space Station. 
And another group that is keenly watching today is, of course, the astronauts who are going to make the uh, first flight on Starliner when we do this again in early 2020. That is, of course, NASA astronaut Mike Fink and NASA astronaut Nicole Mann, along with Boeing astronaut Chris Ferguson. They are down at the Cape watching today's launch from control centers, but we had a chance to uh, sit down and talk with them a little bit, uh, a little bit um, earlier to find out their, uh, their views on this new American crewed spacecraft. In 10 or 15 years, there's going to be more than just one space station. In fact, when we'll say, oh, the space station, people say, which one? And that's going to be really neat. We're going to have people that are going to be able to, to everyday people, regular scientists and engineers, even people with tourists that can buy a ticket to, to go see, to go to the space stations in orbit. We're going to be manufacturing new things that are going to make life better on planet Earth. And there's a great a uh, unique opportunity for our country, United States, to, to establish these industries in low Earth orbit, to make life better on planet Earth, and continue the engine of our, of our economy of high tech. I don't think astronauts are as famous today as they used to be, nor do I think they should be. If everybody who ever flew into space became infinitely famous, then we're not making it available for anybody to go do. So, when we get into an airliner, who knows the name of the captain of the airliner? Nobody knows the, the captain of the airliner. And, and if, if space flight is ever going to become as commonplace as we'd like it to be, um, astronauts are just pilots who get people back and forth to space. It's really going to be this combined effort, probably with multiple commercial industries working together along with governments. And I think that's how we're going to see the future of space exploration, you know, to the moon and then eventually to Mars. You know, we don't have, we wouldn't be able to sustain that type of exploration without commercial industry. Um, and really a lot of it comes down to is the people, right? You need the people, you need the ideas, and you need those folks that come in, and it's good to have a little bit of that commercial competition, right? It keeps everybody going and, and pushing forward towards a goal. It's always great hearing from the crew members themselves. They're getting a front row seat on the future of human spaceflight. And what an exciting future it is uh, for anyone who wants to work in human spaceflight, especially all the young people watching today. Exactly, but first we've got this critical uncrewed flight test, which is an important step in the journey to launch American astronauts from American soil. And NASA will use the data from this test flight to help certify the systems to carry those astronauts we just heard from. We are about 38 minutes from launch now, so we want to check in on the rocket. Dylan, what's the latest you're hearing from the ASOC? Hey, things are continuing to go very well here in the ASOC. Um, we've gotten the report that the, all the ground crews have cleared the crew access tower. They've moved a safe distance away from the pad up to a roadblock on the, uh, on the beach road there. So um, uh, things are going very well here. We do have a weather update planned in about, uh, about eight minutes at L minus 30 minutes. Uh, not expecting any surprises there. Although we've had a breezy past couple of days, the weather continues to be very favorable for a launch on time today. So uh, we're looking forward to that final weather report. Um, and the team here is just uh, continuing to main, remain uh, focused, but very excited. The, the mood here, as has uh, been discussed previously, is really electric. The team is just um, very excited to be uh, getting ever closer to, to launch, and we're really looking forward to that to hitting that T zero at 6:36 here uh, in just a little while. Josh Marie, back to you. Thanks, Dylan. I know for y'all at ULA, today isn't something all that new. You have more than 130 successful launches under your belt. That's why Boeing chose to launch, chose Atlas to launch Starliner. Because when we were deciding on a launch vehicle, ULA was Boeing's obvious choice. When you're talking about launching people, safety and reliability are the biggest priorities. One of the design parameters on the spacecraft from the very beginning uh, was to be launch vehicle agnostic or to be able to move from one launch vehicle to the other uh, without a significant amount of design change on the spacecraft. For the early flights of the Starliner, we selected the Atlas V because of its unparalleled safety and mission assurance. The long-term success in this market is going to be driven by customer confidence in the safety and reliability. Every aspect of our spacecraft and our systems has been designed with that as a primary goal. Now you ULA has launched NASA science missions to almost every planet in the solar system, but this is the first time they're tasked with launching astronauts. It's a very special mission for everyone involved, and it's taken years to get here, but let's take a look at some of the hard work that's happened just over the past few months to get these vehicles ready for today. 
There you see um, the Atlas V being stacked at the vertical integration facility. This operation was taking place um, on November 4th. Um, and this was in preparation for a Starliner to be rolled out and made it on top. So you see um, the different stages of the rocket being hoisted into position there. And there's Starliner in front of our commercial crew and cargo processing facility. It's an old space shuttle uh, garage, essentially. And there it is rolling in front of the iconic vehicle assembly building here at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, this rollout was on November 21st. It took about a six mile path out to the launch pad. We got some beautiful drone footage of that day. I love these shots. It was a gorgeous day with a spacecraft rolling down the beach. You know, a site you can really only see here at the Kennedy Space Center. There it is going down Beach Road, approaching that vertical integration facility. It'll be picked up by a crane and integrated with the rocket. And that really only takes a couple of hours. It's pretty impressive how quickly our teams can work on this. And then from there, it was ready to be rolled out to the pad for, I know Tori talked about earlier, that wet dress rehearsal with the fueled rocket. That was the integrated day of launch test for all the teams to practice one final time before today. Exactly, there it is rolling for that test. And most of that video covers the last few months as we got ready for launch, but it really doesn't even scratch the surface of all the hard work it's taken by so many people to get Starliner ready for today. But we are finally here today, so let's go back to the BMCC to see how Starliner's doing. Tori, our launch team, tra our launch team's tracking any issues right now. Hi, Josh. Uh, here in the BMCC, we are not tracking any issues. It looks like everything is set and ready for for a good and clean launch here uh, in the. In, at KSC. Now, uh, you can see the, the people in the room here are all uh, really tied into data that's coming in, and all of these teams are really just looking at a bunch of data that's coming off the rocket in real time right now to ensure that everything that we see is well inside envelopes for a safe and successful flight. Everything is looking great here in the BMCC, so back to you, Josh and Marie. All right, thanks a lot, Tori. Uh, we want to give you a closer look of those beautiful views of Starliner and Atlas V over on Space Launch Complex 41. You can see it right behind us. Yeah, we're about 33 minutes away from launch, so let's take a look at what the launch and ascent phases of Starliner's mission will look like today. starts at T-minus zero with liftoff after the Atlas V booster engines roar to life and send the vehicle skyward. Soon after, at T-plus 12 seconds, the rocket begins the roll program, putting the crew in a heads-down position to help with acceleration forces. Max-Q starts at 41 seconds. That's also known as max aerodynamic pressure. This is a critical time when the atmospheric forces on the rocket are the highest they'll reach. At 1 minute 35 seconds, the two solid rocket boosters run out of fuel and burn out. Less than a minute later, at plus 222, they separate from the booster. The main engine keeps burning for almost two more minutes, then at plus 429, booster engine cutoff, or BECO. Six seconds later, the booster stage separates, and six seconds after that, so does the ascent cover on top of Starliner. At plus four minutes, 45 seconds, the Centaur upper stage ignites, pushing Starliner to near orbital speeds. Then at plus 5.05, the aeroskirt jettisons, since Starliner and Centaur are free of the atmosphere and no longer need that aerodynamic support. After a long six plus minute push from Centaur, main engine cutoff, or MECO, happens at plus 1154. Then, when Centaur successfully separates almost 15 minutes after launch, the rocket's job is done, but Starliner is not quite in orbit yet. After a long 16 minute coast and 31 minutes after launch, Starliner ignites four of its aft facing OMAC engines for the orbital insertion burn, and the ascent profile is complete. It's definitely going to be an exciting ascent, but before the rocket is declared ready for launch, some teams have to report readiness in some upcoming polls. Right before the launch vehicle poll, the Starliner control rooms are up first. Both teams in Florida and Houston are preparing to report out, so let's go back to Houston and see how they're doing. Steve, how's mission control? Thank you, Josh. Everything looks very exciting there in Florida. 
Here, Richard Jones will be polling his team in just a few minutes. This is the final chance for him to get a go-no-go no go from his team of system specialists. And then he will use that poll to inform his own go-no-go no go decision for the launch conductors poll later that will uh, set the stage to come out of terminal count. And meanwhile, in space, the International Space Station crew is standing by for today's launch as well. They are Commander Luca Parmitano from the European Space Agency, ESA, NASA flight engineers Christina Cook, Jessica Mir, and Andrew Morgan, and Roscosmos flight engineers Oleg Skropochka and Alex Kortsov. They're all going to be waiting on board the space station for Starliner's arrival tomorrow, but Mir and Cook have a particularly crucial road role to play in uh, that rendezvous. They'll be sending commands to the Starliner vehicle, helping with some of the demonstrations to make sure it's going to be able to rendezvous safely. So this will be the next, uh, the next major milestone as we count down towards 20 years of continuous human presence in space. The International Space Station, a football field sized million pound laboratory flying around planet Earth at 17,500 miles per hour. It's our home in low Earth orbit and the bridge to exploring the far reaches of our solar system. A place to learn what it takes to live, to work, to thrive in space. Thanks to space agencies representing more than a dozen countries around the world, it went from the drawing board to liftoff when the first piece flew into space in 1998. That kicked off over a decade of construction, hauling the station to orbit piece by piece on NASA's space shuttle and Russian rockets. And after the first crew arrived in November 2000, we started an unbroken streak of humans living and working in space. Building on the legacy of past outposts like Skylab and Mir, the International Space Station became the training ground for humanity's next great journeys. Learning how to live in space for extreme periods of time, building and perfecting the technologies necessary to travel to our neighbors in the solar system. It gave us a place right on our doorstep to prepare for the next giant leap into the unknown. And thanks to the station, a new era in outer space is unfolding. What was once the domain of only nations and governments is now populated by a growing space fleet from American industry. Private spacecraft to fly cargo and crew members, new habitats and technologies for future space missions, and an open door for companies research institutions, and even students around the world to do research in space that have never had the opportunity before. All laying the foundation for a robust economy in space. There have been thousands of experiments, hundreds of spacewalks, endless hours of challenges and successes, all done by humans hailing from countries around the globe. The International Space Station is what we can achieve as a planet when we come together to do the things that are hard. And the work isn't slowing down. Because we're ready for the next giant leap. Because we're ready to go farther. Because what we do and learn along the way is for the benefit of all of humankind. And you really get an idea from that of the uh, importance of the research and the benefit from the International Space Station. Every day, astronauts living up there doing their experiments. There is nowhere like space to test the systems that astronauts will rely on when they go to the moon and on to Mars. And of course, before we make those flights, we have to make these flights, including carrying um, carrying a few hundred pounds of cargo to the International Space Station, including the food, that uh, will go up as kind of a care package for the crew up there. We're also taking up flags, coins, and the illustrious silver Snoopies. And uh, you know, one of the phrases that you hear a lot in human spaceflight is standing on the shoulders of giants. And that basically represents, uh, represents the, um, the work that our predecessors have done to make this space program so successful and the work that everybody puts in every day to, uh, to achieve these wonderful missions. So items like these, like the flags, they're often used to commemorate and uh, tokens such as Silver Snoopies give us a chance to, uh, for Boeing and NASA to thank the uh, workforce that puts in everything that goes into these flights. 
That's right. That's one more reason to be excited to get Starliner off the ground today so we can get some of that fun cargo back uh, after landing. In the meantime, though, uh, the flight control team here in Houston just gave Richard Jones their go for launch. So uh, everything's proceeding right on time. And we're going to hand back now to Marie and, and Josh. All right, thanks, Steve and Brandy. Um, it is so cool to see you guys there in Mission Control Houston for what will soon be crew launches again. And Josh, I know you and I both know the people behind the scenes, just how many people involved and how long and hard they have just poured their hearts and souls into this. You know, I got chills myself hearing that Mission Control is go, and I know the people sitting on console, you know, they're focused on their data, but it's just such an emotional day for them still. Yep, so we want to go over to Dylan now in the ASOC for a quick status check. Dylan, how's it going over there? Hey, Marie, we're continuing to have a very, very clean countdown here. The team is working no issues. Uh, just a few moments ago, we heard from Launch Weather Officer Jessica Williams and got a, uh, a weather report that's just about as good as it gets from, uh, from Jessica and the Launch Weather team over at the 40th Space Wing, 45th Space Wing. Uh, clear skies. Uh, we're go in all constraints with just a 10% probability of violation for, uh, for ground winds, but those winds are uh, well under our constraints, so we're not looking for, uh, for any with weather issues this morning. Um, you know, one of the big differences between our countdown today as compared to uh, countdowns that we run for our other missions is the length of this final built-in hold. Uh, generally, our final built-in hold is 15 or 30 minutes, and that's dependent on our, on our launch window. But today's built-in hold and the, the built-in hold that we're going to use for commercial crew missions is four hours. And that, during that time is the time when the Boeing team goes back out and uh, finishes loading up that cargo into the Starliner, as well as that's when they launch or load the astronauts as well. Um, those are all the processes that the team has checked out today. Of course, all that is wrapped up and done. Um, so the remaining work we have uh, ahead of us here, are uh, we're going to uh, be closing out our prop and hydraulic systems, get those configured for flight. Uh, the avionics team will be taking uh, the final uh, upper-level wind data, loading that into our avionics system so that the rocket can steer appropriately through, our, uh, through the atmosphere uh, with the upper-level winds. Um, there will be some comm checks completed between the LCC here, Mission Control in Houston, uh, the BMCC over at Kennedy Space Center, and eventually that comm check will include astronauts as well. Um, we'll go get that crew access arm retracted, and then we'll move into our final polling for launch. Josh Marie, that's the update from the ASOC. Thanks, Dylan. That's really about as good a forecast as you can hope for. Fingers crossed that Mother Nature keeps cooperating. Absolutely. And in the meantime, mission teams across the country continue preparing for flight. Now, in case of an emergency on the ground, NASA's Steve Payne is on standby in the Emergency Operations Center. He's the guy you hope you never have to call, but you'll be glad he's there if you do. In an emergency, Steve would coordinate all the resources on site to make sure we get everyone out safely. And in Denver, ULA's Valor team, led by Lars Onsiger, is preparing for ascent. Lars and his team are only on console for ULA during Starliner flights. They're looking specifically for anything that could go wrong on ascent and will relay data to mission control to be prepared for an abort. Today is just practice for them since our abort system is not active and there's not crew on board. Now, throughout the show, we've been answering your questions about Starliner on social media. That's right, and we want to take, uh, we got a really cool photo from a Starliner super fan watching um, all the way across the pond in Ireland. Uh, of course, he didn't get have to get up quite so early because I think it's mid-morning there now, but um, Hayden, thank you so much for sending your photo, and please, if you're watching, um, follow us. Um, use the hashtag AskNASA. Show us how you're watching today's launch. Hayden, I hope he sees a good launch today. And as mission teams prepare for the final parts, oh, sorry, we have a question. Uh, STEM Corps wants to know uh, about the new uh, Boeing Blue spacesuit design and the materials used. So it's made out of Nomex, which is kind of standard for a lot of spacesuits um, because it's you know fire resistant, and so it would keep the astronauts safe if there's anything going wrong. But we added a lot of innovations on top of kind of what the shuttle suit did. Um, I think Chris Ferguson's favorite is it's got a hooded kind of seal, uh, mm -hmm. so it's a soft shell hood. You don't have this heavy helmet on. But otherwise, it's got touchscreen sensi sensitive gloves, uh, more comfortable shoes that were made by Reebok, um, and uh, you know, just overall a much lighter and more comfortable suit for the astronauts. And we will get to see them debut those uh, the next time Starliner flies. Um, so as mission teams prepare for the final parts of the countdown, we want to hear from some of the people who have been working so hard to get this brand new spacecraft to this point. Building a spacecraft is hard. This whole team has been through highs and lows to get here, but being this close to flight is an emotional time for everyone on our team. So let's hear from some of the people who have spent years pouring their hearts into making Starliner. 
If I'm not 100% involved every single day, we are putting, I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional a little bit. Some of us, if, if something's not right, then, you know, we're not gonna sleep that tonight. You know what I mean? If, if something's not right, I'm, I'm not gonna sleep. So we're gonna get it straightened out. You're not just carrying the dreams of a particular company and agency, but of the entire world. Both Boeing and NASA are doing something right now, not just for the benefit of a private company like Boeing, uh, not just for an agency like NASA. They're doing this on behalf of the nation for the benefit of mankind. This is human spaceflight. We've got people, we've got teammates and colleagues that are gonna fly in this vehicle. We need to make sure that we get them there safely and we get them back safely. I'd fly it every time if I could. There's no point to any of this, to commercial human spaceflight, if we don't make sure our crew is safe. Nobody understands this. I don't think anybody really outside of this business understands what we're doing. These spacecraft are hand-built from the ground up, I and mean, we don't even use power tools on them. Any little piece means something important. You don't know what you don't know, and it's just a lessons learned and keeping your eyes and ears open. Everybody watches everybody else. You have to. You can't make mistakes. There is, there is no room for error. I've heard people say, would you make that decision with Chris's wife in the room? And the answer is always yes. You gotta put in 110% every day, you know, and take time from our families to make sure that he can come home to his. Our grass is tall at home and our kids are looking for us, but I'm building a spaceship to get back to a spaceship that I made already. You can't tweak something when you're up there. You can only do it one time. I know what I've done is a pretty good job. I might not be riding on it, but I'm, I'm right there with them. Launch is gonna be a great day, but that's just the start for us. When we see it land and everybody's safe, that's gonna be really when we do the high fives. Now, some of those people are sitting in the BMCC. You're looking at them right now on console. They should be about to enter their final poll. And the Boeing launch teams have reported out from the control room on the hardware readiness. That signaled that Starliner is ready for that terminal count. And Tori's been keeping tabs on their progress. Tori, how are the final Starliner polls going? Thanks, Josh. The star final Starliner polls are going excellent. We actually just heard all the engineering teams go through their final poll so that and say that they are go and green for launch. So everything here out of the BMCC is looking great. We have everybody really tied in and they're ready for that terminal count. Now, we have a message for you at home from the woman who named Rosie the Riveter. Hi everyone, I'm Leanne Corrette. I'm thrilled to be here today at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex inside the Astronaut Hall of Fame, surrounded by the heroes and legends that have inspired the work we're doing here today. My parents actually met while working on the Saturn V program, and I was born right here on Florida's Space Coast. Like many of you, I'm inspired by the wonder of space exploration, and it's humbling to be part of this moment in history. We're so proud that Starliner is the very first human spacecraft to be built and launched right here in Florida. Thank you to all the teams across the country and as far away as Australia who designed, built, and tested Starliner. And thank you to NASA. We've been a proud NASA partner since the earliest days of space exploration, and I can't wait to see what we'll accomplish together in the years ahead. I want you to know that space is not the final frontier, it's just the next one. Thanks to Starliner, getting there will be safe, efficient, and attainable. Thank you for watching our show, and enjoy the launch. Now, Leanne is probably one of the people most excited about this. Whenever you talk to Space about her, her eyes just light up, so we're all hoping for a great launch. We actually just got confirmation that they are configuring Starliner for the terminal count, we are all go right now. If you are just joining us, we're minutes away from Starliner's first launch attempt. And ULA uh, will be getting ready soon to begin um, its poll to enter the terminal count. Right now we're about 16 minutes from liftoff. 
Now this is a critical point in the countdown after the launch clock restarts at T minus four minutes. If another hold is called, we will scrub for the day. Hold, hold, hold on countdown one. Status check to proceed with terminal count. Atlas systems, propulsion, go. Hydraulics, go. Pneumatics, go. LO2, go. Water, go. Centaur systems, propulsion, go. Pneumatics, go. LO2, go. LH2, go. Has gas, go. Electrical systems, airborne, go. Ground, go. Anomaly chief, AC is go. Range coordinator, clear to proceed. Launch director, launch director is go, and you have permission to launch. We count that clock will resume up by mark. Three. We have a few minutes now to answer uh, more of your questions about Starliner. We have one from Ingram, um, wants to know, you have certain weight concerns, obviously. Um, so how do you take into account the weight of the paint used on Starliner? So of course, every pound matters on a spacecraft. And that's why we didn't use too much paint that we don't need. If you can you know, tell on the vehicle, there's some, some style paintings on there, uh, the NASA logo, the Boeing logo, those kind of cool dash marks around the top. Um, but that's the only paint that you know Starliner doesn't need. That gray paint covering is actually there for thermal uh, properties. You might remember if you've been following Starliner for a while, it used to be white. But as we continued our analysis, we decided that gray would be a little better and safer on reentry. So we covered it up with this special gray paint that is uh, very heat resistant. Yeah, and you, I mean, you can see it well. It's obviously, it's really early in the morning. The sun's not up yet, but we've, you can tell that kind of color um, on the capsule at the top of the rocket on the pad there. Yeah, exactly. It's actually uh, making use of uh, thermal blankets. The gray part is thermal blankets that you might remember from the space shuttle. And the little black parts are thermal tiles, also from the space shuttle. But we have a brand new heat shield on the bottom. I think we have time for one more question. So we, were, we also got another interesting question about uh, the G-forces. Um, Moon Man wanted to ask about uh, the max loads expected during ascent. Um, and then will the bo booster throttle down to maintain those lower Gs? So that's actually a great question. Uh, we're f that ULA is flying a very unique trajectory for us. Um, it's going to fly flatter, as Moon Man said. Um, and the booster will actu actually throttle down during the later stages of flight. Uh, to maintain three and a half G's on the crew members, I want to, oh, no, the crew access arm is about to retract. I thought it was retracting there. But yeah, so Atlas will fly a little uh, different flight than it's normally used to for us today. But three and a half G's is uh, not uncomfortable for the crew. It's safe for them. Uh, Chris Ferguson has described it still kind of feels like a gorilla sitting on your chest, <laughs> but that's it's a colorful description. <laughs> it's about normal for most launches. And. We want you to keep those questions coming. Thank you for all the great questions. Just remember to use the hashtag AskNASA. And we're standing by now, keeping an eye on Space Launch Complex 41, um, waiting for that crew access arm to begin its retraction. And when that happens, we will start to see um, the arm swing away. We'll see the, the white room slowly move away from Atlas. And that's um, going to be one of the last visible things that we'll see ahead of launch. So up to this point, if there were crew on board um, right before the crew access arm moves is where we'd configure the launch abort system. Um, we'll see it slowly kind of move away, but it can actually swing back to the capsule in under 20 seconds for a less urgent emergency, like if there were a lightning storm coming and the crew had to get off the pad. But really, after that access arm goes away, if they need to get off, they're gonna, they're gonna leave on Starliner. And Josh, you mentioned the abort system. I know that's not active on this flight. Can you help explain to people why? Yeah, so uh, ULA has this new emergency detection system on the top of their Centaur upper stage. It's basically two extra computers that are plugged into the rest of the rocket, and they are just um, you know, really making sure that that system is going to work. Uh, we don't want to cause a premature abort since that's, this is the first time that that system's on Atlas. But you know, that system is looking for what's called fast trigger aborts. So those are something that will happen so quickly that a human wouldn't be able to detect it. And so we're going to see that, uh, that's of, of course, is going to be activated. Um, the next time Starliner flies, that, that next flight's going to be called the Crew Flight Test, and that will carry uh, Boeing astronaut Chris Ferguson, NASA astronauts Mike Fink, and Nicole Mann. Um, and they will be, next time, sitting right on top of that Atlas V inside Starliner. Uh, but, but, but for today, of course, we've got Rosie inside, Snoopy inside, um, and uh, 600 pounds of NASA cargo. Um, and we are a little over 11 minutes away from launch now. Again, just standing by because we want to make sure you get to see live um, that crew access arm swinging away. So we're just keeping an eye on things for you. There you can see uh, 
centaur venting. It, that's completely normal for these launches. It's um, very cold liquid hydrogen and oxygen that are in that fuel tank. And as they uh, heat up, they start to expand and vent out the top there. Arm control, stow the crew access arm for launch. Roger. There, we just heard the call that they're about to stow that crew access arm. We've also got confirmation that Starliner is running on internal power. It is not relying on ground power anymore, pulling power from its own batteries. If you're just joining us, we're just over 10 minutes from liftoff and we are, oh, there it is. The, it looks like the crew access arm is beginning to move away from Starliner. You can see the white room ever so slightly starting to uh, make its swing. Again, this is one of the last major steps. The next is the launch vehicle pull. Then we will release the four minute hold. And then we're Flight ready for launch. Flight verified CST 100 on internal power. Verified. Now as that crew access arm retracts, again, uh, the final pull for today is the launch vehicle pull. If you've watched Atlas launches, it will sound very familiar. There's a big old piston pulling back that crew access arm. And after Atlas is declared ready for launch, NASA and Boeing will jointly decide whether they're going to move forward with the countdown. Again, about nine minutes away from launch. All right, and there you see the crew access arm uh, just finishing its swing away from the Atlas V rocket and Starliner. And we want to go over to Dylan Rice in the ASOC um, for a status update. Dylan? Hey, Marie. So uh, we're continuing to have a very clean countdown here. Uh, we're just a few moments away now from Chief Launch Conductor Doug Lebo conducting that terminal count status check poll, which will take us into our uh, final, final countdown to launch. Uh, that terminal count status check poll is uh, the uh, final check from each operator, uh, operators associated with the ground systems, the launch vehicle, the uh, spacecraft, and the eastern range to ensure that uh, all systems are ready to go for us to proceed into a terminal count and uh, get the rocket launched. So we're just about a minute away from that now. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, we've executed this countdown many times for, for a variety of different missions, but uh, the countdown today feels, um, feels quite a bit different than what we've normally done. The, the excitement here is just, uh, is just uh, unbelievable. And we are, we are very, very, um, very, very excited to uh, see this, see this mission go and, and go on time, especially with such a clean countdown like we've had today. So we're really looking forward to this. Um, the team has not been talking any, any issues at all on any of the other nets that I've been listening to. So we're at, when that terminal count status check starts, um, we're expecting to hear goes across the board. So I think we'll, uh, we'll stand by here and listen for uh, Chief Launch Conductor Doug Lebo to uh, get that poll started here in about 20 seconds, I think. Status check to proceed with terminal count. Atlas systems, propulsion, go. Hydraulics, go. Pneumatics, go. LO2, go. Water, go. Centaur systems, propulsion, go. Pneumatics, go. LO2, go. LH2, go. Has gas, go. Electrical systems, airborne, go. Ground, go. Facility, go. RFFTS, go. Flight control, go. GC cube, go. Op support, go. Com. Go. Umbilicals. Go. Arm control. Go. ECS. 
Go. Redline monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Flight director. Flight is go. Launch director. LD is go, and LC, you have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. ALC, verify T0 is set for 11, colon, 36, colon, 43, Zulu. Verify. Well, Josh, Marie, you heard it. We are go for launch, right on time. All right, thanks, Dylan. Yeah, we heard some cheers behind us um, over at the press site when we heard that you have permission to launch. Um, and I know they're feeling good about that over in the Boeing Mission Control Center. Tori's standing by over there, and we're hearing she's got a very special guest to say hello. Thanks, Marie. Yes, I do have a very special guest here today. I have Chris Ferguson, first Boeing astronaut and formal spa former space shuttle commander. So, Chris, you heard the poll. You were in. You were here. You know, being part of some of the other polls this morning. Can you tell us how it's going? Um, well, every launch has its exciting moments. Uh, we had a few earlier with a minor uh, issue that came up, but we've developed all the necessary rationale to go flying. And uh, you just listened to the poll. Uh, basically, everybody is in line and in agreement that uh, we're in a good configuration to go fly. So. Uh, it uh, it was a little close, but hey, we're uh, we're going to be off to the races here in a few short minutes. I know this is this is really exciting time, right? Less than five minutes here until launch. So, you know, it's it's funny when we say we're less than five minutes to launch, but I know that you've been on the program for about eight years now. So, mm -hmm. all of this I know has been leading up to this moment and to CFT. Can you tell us a little bit more about your role within the Starliner program? Uh, I joined the program about, like you said, eight years ago, shortly after the space shuttle program ended, and uh, it's, uh, it's been wonderful uh, to be a part of the team. It's been wonderful to have some influence in the design, uh, and now, you know, it's almost surreal. There it is out on the pad. You know, the labor of the last uh, eight and a half years is, is sort of coming to, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's game day, right? The, the big test is, and, and mind you, um, you know, our big game, right, for the spacecraft actually begins when the launch vehicle releases us 11 minutes from now. So we've got a lot of work to do, even though this is the exciting part that everybody enjoys watching the launch. Um, our big test really begins when the launch vehicle sort of releases us and, uh, and we have to go, you know, perform all the necessary demonstrations to get ready to dock to the International Space Station tomorrow. So we've got a busy 24 hours. Yeah, Chris, that is that is really <laughs> exciting, right? It, it's busy, but I know the teams here are up for the challenge. Absolutely. All right, Josh Marie, thanks for coming to us. Back to you. Oh, well, it was great hearing from Chris. Uh, we are three minutes and 20 seconds away. The T minus four minute hold was released while Chris was uh, telling us about how excited he is for Starliner. So we are going to quiet down, listen into the loops. Um, I want to note that on ascent, because we have so many control rooms, you will be hearing reports from the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center from JSC, and Marie and I will stick around. Securing LO2 topping. Atlas tanks to flight pressure. Two minutes, 50 seconds. FTS internal. Two and a half minutes. Atlas tanks are at flight levels. Centaur will be momentarily. If you're just joining us, we're approaching two minutes from the very first flight of Boeing CST-100 Starliner to the International Space Station. 159. Vehicle internal. 155. Block sequencer start. 150. Securing Centaur LH2. Securing Centaur LO2. There's the rocket is now on internal power as well. Both Atlas and Centaur tanks. Launch enabled. 137. FTS armed. That was the flight termination software with Atlas Veers off course.
120. OC is armed. SCS count started, EDS ascent mode. That was that emergency detection system, EDS. T-minus one minute. Rock, report range status. Range green. 54. BLP started. Thirty seconds. T minus twenty five seconds. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go Starliner. Go Starliner. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And lift off the rise of Starliner and a new era in human spaceflight. Now 10 seconds into flight. Vehicles begun the pitch over program. Body rate responses look good. Now 15 seconds in. DU's gone to close with control. Party money looks good at full thrust. Same good shape of pressure on the SRVs. Now 26 seconds into flight. RD-180 now throttling down to partial thrust as expected. Engine response looks good. Now 38 seconds in. RD-180 engine operating parameters continue to look good. Vehicle is now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. Chamber pressures on both SRVs continue to look good. RD-180 engine operating parameters also continue to look good. Now passing one minute into flight. And Mach 1, Atlas 5 is now supersonic. And vehicle now throttling up. Engine response looks good. Continue to see good chamber pressure on both SRVs. One minute, 20 seconds into flight. Body rate responses on the vehicle look good. One minute, 30 seconds in. Standing by for SRV burnout. And we have burnout on both solid rocket boosters. Atlas will hold on to the SRBs for an additional 48 seconds prior to jettison. RD-180 has gone back up to full thrust as expected. Engine response looks good. One minute, 50 seconds in. Atlas is now 17 miles in altitude, 11 and a half miles downrange distance, traveling at 2,300 miles per hour. Now passing two minutes into flight. RD-180 engine operating parameters continue to look good at full thrust. And at 2 minutes 11 seconds into flight, the Atlas rocket now weighs just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of 2,800 pounds per second. And we've seen good indication of jettison of both solid rocket boosters. Vehicle's gone to closed loop guidance. Now just under two minutes remaining in the booster phase of flight. Two minutes, 35 seconds into flight. RD-180 continues to perform well. Engine's now throttling down slightly. Engine response looks good. And Atlas V is now traveling at over five times the speed of sound. Centaur reaction control system is now pressurizing to flight levels. System response looks good. Three minutes, 10 seconds into flight. Atlas V is now 38 miles in altitude, 80 miles downrange distance, traveling at 5,800 miles per hour. RD-180 engine operating parameters continue to look good. Now one minute remaining until engine cutoff. Body rate responses continue to look good throughout the booster phase of flight.
and RD-180 is now throttling to maintain a constant 3.5G acceleration limit. Engine responses will all look good. Three minutes, 55 seconds into flight. And Centaur has begun the boost phase chill down sequence. 20 seconds to Biko. RD-180 continuing to look good as it throttles to maintain that constant 3.5G acceleration limit. Atlas PU has gone to open loop in preparation for Biko. And standing by for Biko. And we have Biko booster engine cutoff, standing by for stage separation. And we have good indication of stage separation. We have pre-start on the RL-10, standing by for ignition. We have ignition and full thrust on both RL-10 engines. Chamber pressures look good on both engines. We have confirmation of ascent cover jettison on Starliner. And we have good indication of aeroskirt jettison. Centaur now resuming active attitude control after successful aeroskirt jettison. Chamber pressures on both RL-10 engines continue to look good. This was a very critical piece of the mission here. Staging is always a very dynamic piece of flight. Now passing five minutes, 30 seconds into flight. And the Centaur RCS system is beginning the initial thruster firings for system thermal conditioning. System response looks good. Now, once again, Centaur will continue burning for about another five minutes. Now passing six minutes into flight. And Centaur is now 95 miles in altitude, 570 miles downrange distance, traveling at 12,000 miles an hour. Those dual RL-10 engines continue to propel Starliner. They are uh, making up for a little bit of uh, the booster flying a flatter trajectory and at lower thrust, again, to maintain that 3.5 G forces. Again, a first flight for the dual engine Centaur on an Atlas V. Starliner and Centaur continue to head to orbit. Throughout the Centaur burn, chamber pressures have remained very stable. Just under five minutes now remaining in the burn. And Centaur is now 102 miles in altitude, 800 miles downrange distance, traveling at 12,700 miles per hour. And the Centaur propellant utilization system continuing with active control looks good. Body rate responses are all very close to null. That means Atlas is flying almost exactly where it needs to be. Periodic thruster firings as expected. Now passing eight minutes into flight. If you are just joining us, eight minutes into Starliner's first flight. We've been through a successful booster stage separation. Centaur continues to propel Starliner. The next major milestone will be main engine cutoff at 11 minutes and 58 seconds. Both Centaur RL-10 engines are continuing to perform well throughout the burn. Chamber pressures look good.
And now coming up on nine minutes into flight, Centaur is 101 miles in altitude, 1,200 miles downrange distance, traveling at 14,300 miles per hour. Now the two control rooms you are looking at on the left, that is ULA's Denver Operations Control Center. They are a backup control room for the control room on the right, which is the actual Atlas Space Flight Operations Center. They were the ones who launched the rocket about nine and a half minutes ago. As you can see, everyone is locked in on their screens, monitoring data. You might have noticed there wasn't much excitement during launch, but ULA will be happy once we get to uh, stage separation, which is coming up almost 15 minutes after launch, so about five minutes from now. Centaur system performance remains nominal throughout this burn, continuing to see stable values on our fuel and oxidizer tank pressures, main vehicle battery temperatures and pressures, and continue to see good pressures on our helium and hydrazine storage bottles. Telemetry quality has been good throughout this burn, only seeing very uh, brief minor dropouts. Now approximately one minute remaining in the burn. So once Centaur again, propellant. after Starliner separates from Centaur coming up in about four minutes, Starliner will circularize its orbit with an orbital insertion burn. Again, about 30 seconds to a main engine cutoff. Chamber pressures on both RL-10s continue to look good. Now ahead of main engine cutoff, we are seeing good tank pressure on Starliner itself. Batteries are in a nominal temperature, good pressure sensor readings from Starliner as it prepares to free fly for the first time in orbit. Standing by for main engine cutoff. And we have Miko, main engine cutoff. Body rate responses have remained very stable. Now passing 12 minutes into flight. Now Starliner will stay attached to Centaur again until about 15 minutes. They're expected to separate at 14 minutes and 58 seconds after liftoff. And that will be the first time Starliner free flies in orbit. And at that point, uh, Richard Jones and his team in Houston will have full control over the vehicle. And they will set it up for an orbital insertion burn that will take place 16 minutes after separation. Approximately two minutes now remaining until OFT capsule separation. Body rate responses uh, continue to look very stable throughout this coast. So you're looking at the Boeing Mission Control Center there. At this point, they have transitioned to a mission support room. The people you're seeing sitting on console designed, tested, and built Starliner. They are the experts on the systems. So if flight controllers need any help, they will be the ones answering the call. 15 minutes, 30 seconds into flight. Now in just over a minute, we're expecting to hear that Starliner has separated from the vehicle. And about one minute now remaining until OFT separation.
Body rates in the roll pitch and yaw direction, all very close to null. And about 30 seconds away from spacecraft set. Now standing by for spacecraft separation. And we have good indication of separation of the OFT capsule. There it is. ULA has successfully completed their piece of the mission. Starliner is free flying for the first time in space. From here, the Johnson Space Center mission controllers will be flying Starliner. We will hear reports exclusively from there. And Starliner's software has been switched to orbit mode, meaning the spacecraft is executing the commands it needs for operating in space following a successful launch into orbit, into the orbital trajectory. This is just one step flight controllers are taking in configuring Starliner now that it's flying on its own. Flight controllers are setting up for the orbital insertion burn, which will take place in about 15 minutes, a little over 15 minutes. And that'll circularize Starliner's orbit as it sets off to chase the International Space Station. The team here is also turning off several systems that were needed for powered flight, but are not necessary now that Starliner is in orbit. While some are turned off, others will be turned on, such as the thruster housings that will be used to maneuver Starliner in space, and the solar arrays. The thrusters will steer Starliner through orbit, and the solar arrays will, of course, convert the sun's energy into uh, electric energy to charge the spacecraft batteries. The Centaur has intentionally left Starliner in an in an elliptical trajectory that would make it easy for the spacecraft and more importantly its future crews to come back to Earth at this point if there were a problem. But that means it's all on Starliner to make it the rest of the way into a stable orbit and on track for the space station docking. This is where Starliner's orbital maneuvering and attitude control engines come into play. Those 20 engines can provide each up to uh, 1,400 pounds of thrust, which is more than enough to neatly heave Starliner that last little bit into orbit. They'll fire for about 40 seconds, setting Starliner on the right path, not only for docking with the space station, but also a series of demonstrations that Starliner will perform before docking. And those demonstrations will prove that Starliner is ready to safely dock with the space station. They actually began on the launch pad when we performed a check to make sure that Starliner's GPS and navigation systems agreed that it was indeed on the launch pad. After the upcoming orbital insertion burns, the demonstrations will continue so that ground controllers can ensure that the spacecraft systems are functioning correctly. When these first demos are complete, Starliner will resume its path to the International Space Station, and our systems here are telling us that these early, uh, early steps are complete, and Starliner systems are doing exactly what they are supposed to do. We still have a few minutes before that orbital insertion burn, about 13 uh, minutes uh, until it takes place. So let's go back to Florida, where Josh and Marie have watched a spectacular morning liftoff. Brandy, it was a beautiful launch from here in Florida. It took off right here behind us. It is, you know, s the sun is starting to rise. There's a little bit of a rocket plume left over there behind yeah. us. No rocket left back there, but it was just, I mean, it was stunning to see. I mean. I know you weren't looking from this view, you were looking much closer, but I mean, we just turned around in our seats to, to watch it here and we could feel the rumble. And I know um, you didn't see people celebrating in the control rooms because you know their job's not done at liftoff. It goes beyond that much further. And so um, people are, I think now just beginning to breathe again. Um, and so folks are just, uh, so happy about um, this accomplishment. I mean, obviously, this is just the beginning of the mission, but um, such a huge, momentous occasion this morning. And uh, we're actually hearing that uh, in the BMCC, uh, Tori Pedrotti is with Lewis Atchison, who was Starliner's very first launch conductor and saw us through 
a successful first launch. Tori and Lewis, got to be feeling pretty good right now. Yes, thank you, Josh. That is, uh, it's really excellent to have Lewis here and to have, you know, take him away from console for just a minute to talk with us. So, Lewis, I know that you and Chris Ferguson have been very close through this entire process, and I know that he asked you to create the launch procedures. Can you give us some, some details about that? Sure. I think, uh, as you all know, Chris has a, a very uh, vested interest in how the launch procedures were put together. Uh, I started with the program uh, probably about seven years ago. About uh, a year in, I was still a flight test engineer on the program. Uh, happened to run into Chris on, in the elevator on the way to work one morning, and quite frankly, I didn't know he knew my name, but um, he said, hey, Lewis, um, if you got a little bit of spare time, can you uh, work and maybe see if you can figure out how these launch procedures are going to work for the program? And uh, of course, I was like, "Oh yeah, sure, spare time. I can I can find time to you know, gen up some launch procedures." Uh, so that began a uh, basically a six-year journey on um, finding a unique way to integrate uh, the United Launch Alliance Atlas V launch procedure, which is a tried and tested launch process, uh, with something that had never flown before, our space capsule, and were a lot different than any of the other payloads that they've flown. So as you can imagine, we had to merge several different cultures. Um, our flight control team, which is uh, really homegrown from NASA. Our ground control team, which is uh, here um, at C-3PF that performs a lot of the spacecraft power-up activities. And you're and, located here in the C-3PF, correct? That's correct, yeah. right. I'm, I'm Florida local. <laughs> Uh, so working through those processes, procedures, and, and finding a way to integrate all that, and oh, by the way, we have to find time to load a crew one day. And uh, so taking that and marrying those things up so that everything comes together for an instantaneous launch window. So today, fortunately, we made our window. Um, it, you know, it's a first flight program. We saw some challenges over the evening, but uh, we've got a world-class team here, and they were able to pull through the little things that we were uh, seeing. Fortunately, we've had a good training program along the way. And uh, it's just an incredibly exciting day. I know, and seeing so far a successful flight has just been one of the best experiences I've had working on this program. Um, but so you mentioned, you know, we had some a little bit of setbacks, some issues that we needed to work through. So I'm guessing today didn't go exactly according to plan. No first flight ever does. <laughs> So yeah, we were um, we were working a couple issues with the uh, comm subsystem. Uh, fortunately, the flight control team was able to work it out before we went to fly today. Uh, a few days ago, we had a couple issues with the uh, hatch, which we were able to, um, which we learned about when we did our integrated day of launch test, was which was actually a fantastic test. Uh, we did a couple of modifications to account for the fact that um, when there's pressure changes outside, we need to. Uh, bleed a little bit of that pressure off so that we can get the hatch open. You'd be surprised how just a little pressure difference over a large surface area makes it really tough to open. So we were able to get that fixed so that the pad team here and the recovery team in the desert are going to be able to open that side hatch uh, pretty seamlessly. Oh, that's, that's excellent. And it's there's nothing like a flight test to learn these things, right? So this is the reason why we why we test. I completely agree. And and this being the first launch that I've had the opportunity to work in a control center right next to the launch vehicle, um, it, we've simmed, we've trained for this, and there was nothing quite like the feeling of the uh, monitors and the floor shaking after that rocket took off today. So it was a amazing electric atmosphere here this morning. I, I completely agree. Is there anything that you'd like to share with the team, you know, here in Florida, back in Houston, anybody watching? Sure. So, um, first of all, uh, I have to thank my family for all the, um, the the time, patience, and effort that was put in over the past uh, several years. Uh, we work a lot of long hours to make these kind of things happen, and uh, I realize that they're at home watching, eagerly uh, excited about the, the next part of the mission, which will be the recovery operation that I'm a part of, um, and also the team, right? Uh, this is the one of the greatest team sports you could ever possibly imagine. And it takes a lot of people to make all this happen. And a lot of people need to be at the right place at the right time and know the right stuff in order to make this instantaneous launch window happen. And, and quite frankly, everything happened on this program. Right. Well, thank you, Lewis. It's been great to have you here. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk to us. Uh, thank you. Josh, Marie, back to you. Thank Thanks you. a lot, Tori. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Tori. Uh, well, you know, before we go back to JSC as they're getting ready for the orbital insertion burn, I just want to, you know, send a message out to everyone watching, not here from Florida. If you've never seen a rocket launch before, it's like nothing you've ever seen. I mean, it quite literally looks like another sun is rising up into the sky. So the next time we do this, there's going to be people on board. 
And if you're in the States, you can drive down here to Florida and come watch us fly. Yes, just be prepared for a lot of traffic. Don't expect to be going anywhere anytime <laughs> soon after launch because um, we expect the place to be pretty jammed up just like it was during the space shuttle days. Yeah, uh, I think there was upwards of a million people here. Oh, now, uh, this is actually some video that we got of the pad team right as they were closing up the, the white room, showing us uh, their enthusiasm before they got off the pad and just taking a team moment to reflect on the, the history of this day. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and you don't always see it when we're, we're doing these operational things, but the, the people behind the scenes, I mean, you saw them in that embrace there. It's, it's really like a family. Um, NASA, Boeing, ULA, we work side by side together every day. These people putting in these long hours, are, they're doing this together. Everybody working towards a common goal. And you saw the culmination of that when we had that instantaneous liftoff on the first try. Exactly. And, you know, like you said, it's very much like a family. A lot of these folks are going to be spending Christmas, you know, making sure Starliner is doing well attached to the International Space Station. It just takes so much hard work and dedication to do what they do. Yeah. So. And we want to go back over to Houston. Uh, we are standing by. Uh, in, in before too long, Starliner is going to be in orbit, so we want to get uh, an update from Steve and Brandy to see um, how things are going over there. Hi, guys. Thank you, folks. It is. Uh it is very looking very good here in Houston. We are about um, five and a half minutes away from the orbital insertion burn that's going to circularize the uh, the orbit of Starliner. Starliner is currently flying over Southeast Europe as it begins its chase. Uh, about uh, 25 minutes ago, begun its chase of the International Space Station. That's right. The International Space Station was about 260 miles over a uh, great Australian bite south of Western Australia when it uh, when Starliner launched today. And uh, the crew members on board were sent up some video of their launch, so I know that they were probably following along and cheering with everybody here on the ground as well. You know, they're looking forward to, to seeing Starliner dock to the space station tomorrow. And it's gonna take, um, gonna take um, a little more than 24 hours for the uh, Starliner to reach the International Space Station on this orbital flight test. The uh, regular docking scenario will not take that long when there is a crew on board, but since this is the first flight of Starliner, want to make sure that uh, all the systems are working, that everything's doing what it's supposed to. After all, Starliner is flying itself to this. So even though it's going Mach 25 right now, 17,500 miles an hour to catch up to the space station, still going to take a little time, Make sure all the systems are working the way they're supposed to. Make sure Starliner knows where it is, where it's going, and we'll reach it in time. That's right. And we're now about four minutes away from that orbital insertion burn. Uh, the team here on the ground is uh, following along, making sure that all the systems are, are hooking up and uh, talking like they're supposed to as, as we do get closer to that. That'll be about a 40-second burn. Um, and again, moving uh, space uh, the Starliner into the right orbit to catch up with Space Station. And it's going to be the four um, OMAC engines that are on Starliner. They are um, orbital maneuvering and control engines, 1,500 pounds of thrust each. So combined, a 6,000-pound kick to uh, push Starliner a little bit, uh, a little bit higher, a little bit faster, raise the orbit, and get everything together. Of course, those engines are going to play a big role um, throughout the next 24 hours as uh, the uh, Starliner makes its run at the International Space Station. And we are now about three minutes and 14 seconds away from the orbital insertion burn. This, of course, follows a terrific launch this morning and the power of the uh, Atlas V, putting Starliner on the exact right course and speeding it from zero to orbital velocity in, uh, in just about 11 and a half minutes, I think, of a uh, powered flight. It's amazing how little time it takes to get to space. So controllers here are looking carefully at all of their systems, making sure everything is good. It's very quiet here in the control room, which is always a good sign. That means the uh, controllers are heads down, watching over the systems, and uh, keeping track of everything that's going on just above um, the Middle East now. We're also seeing here that uh, Starliner's reaction control system engines, they are for the fine adjustments, 100-pound uh, class engines, are um, making small adjustments as, uh, as Starliner adjusts its attitude 
moving uh, moving above Earth. Less than two minutes to go until that burn. And you can see here the control room here in Houston, Starliner Mission Control. This is, of course, a uh, flight control room that's uh, been used before for NASA missions, but this is the inaugural Starliner mission, so it's the first time that it's been used for this uh, Boeing spacecraft. And, of course, controllers are used to this room and have spent a number of a number of hours in here doing uh, simulations and everything. It's a... Uh, very professional crew, and uh, many of these folks are uh, veterans of the shuttle um, shuttle mission. Certainly, Richard Jones, the flight director who is overseeing this uh, ascent and, in and uh, entry team. And we are less than a minute away from the orbital insertion burn. Flight controllers here are. Uh, not working any technical issues. The OMAC engines are uh, getting po getting positioned to uh, make that 40 second firing that will circularize Starliner's orbit and get it into a position to continue its chase to the International Space Station, which is itself currently coming up on Central America. And controllers are maneuvering Starliner into the into the right attitude for this uh, for this orbital insertion burn. Controllers watching the uh, systems.
And the orbital insertion burn has been delayed. Controllers are watching the attitude of Starliner as it positions itself and looking at the, uh, at the spacecraft in flight. Once again, that orbital insertion burn that was supposed to take place about five and a half minutes ago has been delayed as the team here on the ground is seeing uh, Starliner uh, not in the in the correct attitude for it. They're, they're working through that and we'll be looking for the next chance to get that done. Currently, Starliner is using its 100-pound class thrusters to maneuver in space. We are 37 minutes into this first flight of Starliner. And flight controllers are uh, seeing what um, the OMAC engines are, of course, 1,500-pound uh, class uh, thrusters, each one of them. There's four of them on Starliner. That's what they'll use to uh, complete the orbital insertion burn. team here in Starliner Mission Control still working through some uh, steps to try and get Starliner in the right attitude for the orbital insertion burn, uh, working on uh, uh, the next the next opportunity for that and, uh, and, uh, and looking to get Starliner in a good position for that. And Flight Director Richard Jones reports that we are in a stable orbit. Starliner is in a stable orbit. Again, Starliner is now in a stable orbit. Uh, they've, they've got it in a stable position, but the teams here on the ground are working through what the, what the best next steps for Starliner should be.
And Richard Jones reports that his flight controllers are turning the Starliner spacecraft to the uh, what we call a tail sun position. That means the solar rays will be pointing to the sun to recharge the uh, batteries on Starliner. And of course, to uh, power the systems on the spacecraft. Starliner is in a stable orbit. And flight controllers are working through all the options at their disposal as this uh, maneuver to put Starliner in a tail sun position takes place. Starliner's flight path and orbit are both stable. And we do have an off nominal insertion reported. We have spacecraft control. Guidance and control teams are assessing their next maneuvers. 
spacecraft batteries are good and the spacecraft is in a stable orbit. View here inside Starliner Mission Control, where flight controllers are working through what the next steps for Starliner should be. You can see Flight Director Richard Jones standing up there beside the uh, behind the Flight Director console, talking with with his team members here in the room. And once again, we have had an um, off nominal insertion. We have spacecraft control, guidance and control teams here at Starliner Mission Control are assessing options, assessing all their options, and uh, contemplating the next maneuvers for the spacecraft. Starliner has good batteries and is in a stable orbit. And the flight control team also reporting that Starliner did uh, finish moving into that uh, tail sun position that will allow its batteries to recharge.
And if you're just tuning in, Starliner lifted off from Cape Canaveral, Florida at 6.36 Central Time this morning. We have had a off nominal insertion and mission control teams here at Starliner Mission Control are uh, assessing all of their options for the uh, Starliner spacecraft. It is in a stable orbit, it has power, and its solar array is facing the sun to recharge its batteries further. That orbital insertion burn was scheduled to take place 31 minutes after launch, uh, but uh, didn't happen on schedule. Again, teams here on the ground are, are evaluating their, their various options, looking at what the best next steps for Starliner might be.
And once again, if you are just joining us, Starliner lifted off from Cape Canaveral, Florida this morning at 6.36 a.m. Central Time to begin its chase of the International Space Station. We have since experienced a uh, off-nominal insertion, and the spacecraft has essentially um, is, is in a stable um, position. It's, it's fully powered. Mission Control here in Houston is assessing all the options. We're going to uh, step away from the broadcast, and you can uh, stay updated on everything that is taking place with the Starliner mission on Boeing.com. We'll also be getting you more information here on NASA TV as the morning progresses. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to sign off for now, but uh, we'll have more information for you soon. Hey, you're watching NASA TV, on the air and online every day, on this planet and beyond.